I came into this interview, I don't want to say underprepared. Like, the great thing about getting to talk with you, Alex, is that I know you really well. Yeah. So I don't feel like I have to prepare to the level that I would for some interviews. And thank God for it. Because, so we're recording this the weekend before President's Day. And this morning, my husband looked at me and he was like, hey, Kitty, when am I going to take Jack skiing? Because snow skiing is my husband's favorite pastime. And he had told me at the beginning of this year, we were talking about how can we make more space in our lives for the things that we love individually, not just together, um, where we each get our own space. And he had decided that he really wanted to take Jack on a father-son ski trip. And I was like, I would, I, that's amazing. I would love for you to do that. That's a bonding experience that I would be so grateful for I'm you to get to I have. feel like I know what you're about to say. Yeah, you know, you know exactly what I'm about to say. So this morning, he looks at the calendar and he says, I, well, it's, I think we should just go today. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Like, you don't have a flight. You don't have a hotel. It's a holiday weekend, which means everything is going to be booked because everyone had the same idea about what to do with a long weekend mm -hmm. in February. Yep. Like, none of Jack's ski clothes fit. We go every year. But but I have someone who's going to give me clothes to borrow for him. And that's in two weeks. That's not right now. Yeah. And he was like, eh, we'll figure it out. And so, like, you know, he but, managed booking the trip and making right. it happen. And I said, okay, while well, you do that, I will go get Jack some ski clothes and mm -hmm. I'll pick him up at school. And, you know, so we're trying to balance what's going on. But I think... Like, these moments are so important because while it was very stressful in the moment, while it made today a little bit of hyperdrive for both of us mm -hmm. trying to pull everything together and make this happen, it also, I mean, not only is it creating a special memory for them, but even though John is responsible for one of the children alone for four days, that's fine. He can handle that. It feels like a break to me to only have one for four days. Is he going alone um, with him? He's going alone with him. Okay. Yeah, just the two of them. They're at the airport right now while we're recording. They might, they're about to board a plane. I'm also like, you know, while this was crazy and not how my brain likes to work, I would really have loved a few months notice to prepare everything for this. Um the reality is this is actually giving toward John's bandwidth. This is giving him space he needs. It's giving them time together. But also when he comes home, is he going to be physically tired? Yes. But he is going to be more emotionally available than he would have been because he has gotten to do something he loves and he's gotten to share it with his child and that's what he really wanted to do. But also the fact that you guys worked together to make it happen. Like he wasn't just like, oh, I wanna go on this trip and then didn't do anything about it, right? Like, but I feel like there are situations where people feel like, you know, if their partner says something, they just have to kind of make it happen. Like it's their job to do that exactly. aspect of it. And that's not how it should be. Like, it exactly. should be, you should be working on things together. You should be working on things together. And like, how can you make it work? But what this also makes me think of is like, you know, you and your husband talking about bandwidth at night and like, what's your, what's your level? What's your overstimulation level? For me, it's re overstimulation is definitely the word. One thing we have started doing at night, and it was our two-year-old who got us doing it. So because this, I love this example because it's so more, it's so much more accessible than like a random, hey, I'm going to take my kids skiing for the weekend. Like that's not an everyday experience for anyone on this planet, right? It will be a great mind break for them. But we have our bedtime routines as every family does. And then Branham started asking to dance. And at first it would just be me and her dancing in the bathroom. And then she started asking for it also on nights when John was putting her down. And then she started calling us all up. And then because we were all there, Jack was like, well, can we at least choose a better song than Coco Melon? <sighs> and so he picked the song. And so now our bedtime routine includes the entire family, including the dog, going upstairs into my kid's bathroom and doing the cha-cha slide. And then 
everybody brushes teeth. And the first couple of times we did it, it was just hilarious. And we were like, we can't believe that we're doing this. But it has become so routine. And what's amazing about that is that I actually find that my levels of overstimulation, and John has said the same thing, are so much lower. Like we look forward to this part of the day when we get to go dance like idiots in our bathroom with our kids. And then we feel better. This episode is sponsored exclusively by Genate by Snip Therapeutics, providing genetics-powered nutrition tailored for every stage of the fertility, pregnancy, and postpartum journeys. With Genate, it's not just about a single product or service. It's about a journey toward optimal maternal and fetal health. From their insightful Genate test to their meticulously formulated prenatal vitamin, every step is a leap forward in maternal care. My own journey with Genate has been transformative, bringing a sense of control and peace in an often unpredictable time. They are changing the game in prenatal nutrition, and I'm proud to be part of the movement to provide personalized health care for every mother out there. Learn more at undefiningmotherhood.com forward slash genate and use code undefining10 for 10% off. It's actually really interesting because my husband literally, so like he always plays really um, high energy with the kids right before bed. And I think there's this misconception that you need to be really calm and quiet right before bed. And he has just always done this thing where like he always does a lot of physical things with them that I either can't or don't really want to do, like throwing them around. And my kids are all big. Like my two-year-old weighs 35 pounds. So like, you know, they're, they're just chunky boys. So yeah, you're, and you're tiny. Like, I mean, you're very tall, but you're tiny. (laughs) But I love that he plays with them like this because they love it so much. And the sound and joy that is happening when they're playing like this, like the second he walks in, they all like run to the door to say hi. And then they say, you know, spin, spin or throw or do all these things. But my husband came home the other night and said that he was reading, I can't remember if he read something or or listened to it on a podcast, but he had seen something that said that type of play before bed is actually helps regulate them. Oh, and I believe it. Honestly, probably the adults too. And so he's like, there's a reason why I do this every night. Yes. And so, and honestly, I think that they do go to bed feeling really just comfortable because they got to get out this extra energy right before they got to bond with their dad. And I just think yes. it's great because they see me all day. And so, mm-hmm. to ha- and I always kind of back off when he's doing yes. that because then they just get this, I mean, also yeah. I don't want to throw them around, <laughs> but like <laughs> then they get this, it's like that, um, I don't know if any, Bluey's very popular. And so there's a game that Bluey plays called Tickle Crabs where it's very physical, where like the kid gets wrapped up in a blanket and like thrown over the shoulder. And in that episode, when Bluey says, oh, let's play Tickle Crabs, the mom gets up and goes, okay, bye, and like walks out of the room. And I'm like, I'm that mom. I'm her. Yes, I am that mom. They mentioned it. I would be too. But the kids then are playing with my husband and it's just so nice. Finding things like you just said, it can be totally unique and random to your family, but it works and it's fun and it kind of helps break down all of the feelings of the day and it's just play and the phones are away and you're just you're just playing and it's fun just to play sometimes, right? It's just a wonderful thing to do with your family, especially at the end of the day and to look forward to it, like he said. Exactly, exactly. To have those moments we know we're going to look forward to. And yeah, I've always been a proponent. Um, it depends on your child, right? It goes back to what you said. There's no one way to parent. Some children take a really long time to come down from that stimulation and they do need a much quieter, softer bedtime routine. My children have a lot of wiggles to get out and like at and bedtime, it's very kid specific I think that's a good point like yes, it's very kid specific because my it is my younger two can play 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 and then just go to bed like they don't yes. need the in-between my older one likes to play 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 and then he likes to read a little in his room before with us actually he's yes. very into Legos so we're currently watching Lego movies like literally oh. reels of other people building Legos <laughs> But, oh my god! Like, that's I what know. He likes to watch. I know. But which is fine. He loves it. He's. It's a passion. Gives him something to do when we have them. But I think with that, I think it's just like 
very kid specific and you find what works for you, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You find what works for you. We've been doing audiobooks as our way of calming because we can do it with the lights off. Um, and so it's a good little transition. And so, yeah, it's it's all about finding what works for you. And especially, you know, that's true for all parents. Um, but then I think, you know, you were talking earlier about parenting after infertility, parenting after loss. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I feel... I don't want to say – I'm just going to use this word, and I mean, I know some people are going to be mad at me for it. A small gift that I personally have received from that experience. I personally, and this may not be true for everyone, um, I am able to enjoy these little moments so much more and live in these moments so much more. And it is because mm -hmm. there is still a part of me that always lives in fear. I do still – find myself even with a six and a half year old saying, I mean, you know, when he graduates and goes to college and moves out all being well, like I'm still caveating like the hopefully that's what's going to happen. Hopefully this is where life is going to take us. I'm still caveating it. While that part I am, I, I wish I could just blindly assume that this is my future. I don't personally seem to have that in me, but I do find I'm really able then to get into these good, amazing moments mm -hmm. and just feel in my soul like this is what I really was not sure I would ever have. And so that's actually like something I also talk to help oh, yeah? women with because I don't think that you need to have the assumption that you will never feel like that personally. I think it's not realistic to never have that anxiety or to never have some of those feelings that come with the way that we became parents, right? So it's I not think, realistic with the way that we became parents. And honestly, even and for people who, even to be for people who came to parenthood very easily, um, I mean, just living in the world we live in. If you watch news cycles and you are even remotely aware of the problems happening in our society, like you cannot live. There is no such thing as parenting without fear or worry. That's That doesn't exist. Um, what exists is learning to work through that and still and still find your best self and your best version of yourself and try your hardest not to pass any of your own baggage and anxieties onto your kids because you know they're going to develop their own. Well, yes. And so I think part of it for me too is that I want moms to, I want to, I help moms see that there is, not only is there not a perfect way to parent, but nobody, everybody has their things, right? But it's more about figuring out who you, who your authentic self is and who you, what your authentic motherhood looks like. And I think that when you're saying, oh, I have these small gifts that I got out of it, I think there's absolutely something to that where there are beautiful parts of it. Like no one wishes it on anyone. You wish you didn't have to go God, through no. it, but you did go through it. And I think to be able to see some of those positive aspects that came, that you got out of it is important because I strongly believe in embracing every single aspect of your motherhood and that includes how you became a mom and so yes. i don't think that you should just try to fix every single aspect of it but i just feel like finding that authentic self and who you are as a mom individually is very important and then also finding people and a kind of tribe of people who support you and understand you is important too.